have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians 4.11. Pastor Gentry already quoted it for us. I would like to say, Pastor Gentry, you're talking about miracles. Pastor, you're talking about miracles. I haven't had a chance to, to say this publicly, but last time I was up here, I had a brace on my knee because I had an unconfirmed tear in my knee. Uh, it was popping out of place, popped out of place probably seven or eight times over a few days period of time. So there was obviously a tear in my knee, but it was not confirmed. Brother Cox prayed for me that weekend. And then I had an appointment the next week. And I went to the appointment, had the MRI done. Uh, the doctor came and, and he said, I, he asked me my symptoms. I said, I said, well, I have told him all my symptoms and he said well you have a classic bucket handle meniscus tear and he said your MRI doesn't show anything let me let me go and look at it again they probably mistakenly missed something he went and looked at it he studied it for a few minutes and he said you know what Ryan there's nothing here and I've played racquetball on it I, I jog every day on it I've had no problems. God healed me miraculously. <laughs> Philippians 4.11 Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul is speaking about how he learned to be content in whatever circumstances that he was in. You know, contentment is a very tricky thing. It can be pretty, a pretty elusive pursuit. We go after what we think will make us happy in life to find out that it didn't work. And, and in fact, sometimes we reflect back and we realize that we were happier before we started the quest. And tonight I want to explore contentment through the eyes of Paul. And I want to, I want to title my lesson tonight, Everything. Because if we find ourselves in a state of discontent, we want everything that we can't have. But if we can somehow make the decision and learn to be content. We find that Christ supplies every, everything that we need. And so I want to title my message tonight, Everything. Can we pray? Lord, I love you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would speak your word through me. And I pray that every individual in this room and everyone watching by way of web right now, Lord, would hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A historian by the name of Arthur Schlesinger said that our society is marked by inextinguishable discontent. He went on to say, we, we want a better job with better pay and we want a better boss. We want better relationships, better spouses, better cars, and, and we want a better backhand in tennis, and we want a longer drive in golf. And we have a propensity to live endlessly for the next thing, the next weekend, the next vacation, the next purchase, and the next experience. We're never satisfied, never content, and we're envious of those who have what, ha what we have not obtained or accumulated. So author called this inextinguishable discontent. And when we take a look around us, we have a world that is COVID fatigued. It's a world that's tired of politics and tired of civil unrest and tired of natural disasters and job loss and cutbacks and debt and changes and this and that. And, and really, if, 
if we come down to it, our world is just plain tired. And in the midst of all of the things that make us tired, people are searching for something. They're searching for contentment. And they're searching for happiness. Did you know that you can't even hardly find an RV right now? If you wanted to buy an RV, you're going to have trouble finding an RV. RVs are selling at an all-time high. In fact, anything that has to do with outdoor fun, it's selling off the shelves right now. Prices are sky high because they just can't keep up with the demand of people seeking these pleasurable things. And it's the chaos of life this year that has people searching for fulfillment. It's, and it's not just toys. It's new jobs and it's new houses and, and new whatever to fill the void. And I don't know about you, but I can just feel the fatigue. I can feel the anxiety. I can feel the uncertainty. I can feel the loss of, of hope among just some of the people that I interact with. Sounds pretty grim, right? Am I encouraging anyone yet? But the Apostle Paul wrote, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. Yikes. When I read that, it, it just it sounds far-fetched. And I just wonder, how in the world could Paul make such a bold statement? Even Paul had lots of headaches and obstacles in his life. And how could Paul make such a bold statement? Whatever I find myself in, I'm content. It just seems far-fetched. There's a song that I like that is sung by Lauren Daigle that's called Everything. And I'm going to sing it for you tonight. <clears throat> I'll spare you that. I'll read the lyrics. How about that? Even the sparrow has a place to lay its head. So why would I let worry steal my breath? Even the roses, you have glowed them brilliant red. Still I'm the one you love more than this. You give me everything. You give me everything. You give me everything I need. Even the oceans push and pull at your command. So you can steal my heart with your hand. You tell the seasons when it's time for them to turn. So I will trust you even when it hurts. You give me everything I need. When I can't see, you lead me. When I can't hear, you show me. When I can't stand, you carry me. When I'm lost, you find me. When I'm weak, you are mighty. You are everything I need. You give me everything. You give me everything. You give me everything I need. You see, Paul had a grasp of the fact that God supplied everything that he needed. And it seems natural to Paul at first, but we have to understand that this sort of contentment that Paul is describing is not something that he was born with. You see, I think Paul is trying to tell us that it's more of a decision that a person makes. It's a learning process. This is the guy that wasn't content just to preach to the Jews. He, he had to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he was messing up everything. And he wasn't even circumcising them. He was never content just to maintain the status quo. And yet the most famous verse about contentment in the entire Bible came out of Paul's mouth. That's pretty interesting to me. It's almost like he's describing Contentment not as a disposition, but as a skill that can be learned. How many of you would love, just love to have more contentment in your life? 
The book of Philippians is a letter to a church that Paul founded. We don't know exactly where Paul was when he wrote this letter, but we do know that he was a prisoner somewhere. And I'm not sure if it's important to know where he was physically as much as it's important to know where he was emotionally and spiritually. So here's what he said, some of the last words of this letter to a church that he fathered a a decade earlier. Philippians 4 verse 10 But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein you were also careful, not ye lacked opportunity, not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned, learned, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So Paul was saying, I wasn't born this way, but I have learned. It took me a... It took me a little while to learn this, but I have learned to be content. I had to have God say no to some things that weren't best for me so that I can learn the hard way to trust Him. To trust that that, that He has given me everything that I need. But I've learned by now to be content no matter what circumstances I find myself in. Whether it be a shipwreck or, or a prison or... You name it, I've learned to be content. Verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. So I know what it means to have a little. And I know what it means to have a lot. I've learned that it's not my situation that regulates my satisfaction. Everywhere and and in all things I am instructed, there it is again, I'm, I'm learning, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. It doesn't matter the situation. Living in plenty or living in want, it doesn't matter. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. You were the only one. Verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound... And I am full, having received of, and I'm going to butcher this word, Epiratus. I don't know. If you're looking for a Bible name for your kid, this is a good one. Sure. The things which were sent from you, I'm going to pass over that one. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable. Well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I'm just curious. How did a passage that started out talking about Paul's imprisonment end by talking about their needs? Paul knows that God cares specifically about our needs. I think a major misunderstanding that people have is that God is just a a God of restrictions. And as I study Scripture more and more, I see a God that's more of an endless permission. Even the rules and, and the regulation that He set for His people are designed to bring His people closer to Him and into more freedom with Him. And when the children of Israel were coming out of the land of Egypt, after they had crossed the Red Sea and left Pharaoh behind, one of the first things that he did in getting them out of Egypt was to get Egypt out of them. Because that's the hard part. Not, Not to bring you into freedom, but to teach you how to live in freedom. You see, true freedom for many of us doesn't doesn't feel familiar. 
And we would rather stay in something that enslaves us, that is, that is predictable, instead of embracing something that is new and that is good and that is true and that is pure. So we'll go back and we'll go back to familiar addictions and familiar mindsets and familiar toxic emotional states because it feels normal to us. And we'll choose normal over God's better. Won't you look at your neighbor and tell him, God wants me free. Free from what people think about you. Free from the need to have more stuff. Free from the need to have approval from others. Free from sin. Free from addictions. Because Jesus Christ provides everything that we need. Including validation. Including our physical needs. Including our emotional needs. Including our spiritual needs. He provides everything that we need. God wants you free. How many of you believe that? How many of you really believe that? I find it interesting that God used someone who was in chains to teach his people about freedom. Paul is writing a theological discourse on freedom from a prison cell. And it's interesting that Paul, who is in prison, sounds more free than many of us sound. Paul knew that contentment was not in what he had or even what he accomplished, but contentment came in the depths of who Paul was and who he served. Because a lack of contentment causes me to, to look horizontally, to look at what others have and what others are doing and, and what they're accomplishing, which in turn causes me to never truly feel satisfied and feel free. But contentment invites me to look vertically at God. And when I look in His direction, regardless of my possessions or my, or my lack of possessions, regardless of my status or my lack of status, regardless of my ability or my lack of ability, regardless of my approval or my lack of approval, regardless of any of those things, I draw comfort from knowing that Jesus Christ is enough that Jesus Christ is everything to me. I called a man yesterday, and he's probably one of the wealthiest men that I, that I personally know. Um, I would imagine that he's a millionaire many times over. He can buy anything and everything he wants. And I asked him, with all of your financial stability, with being able to pretty well buy anything that you want, are those things lasting fulfillment and contentment for you? He can buy any house that he wants, any car that he wants. He can go on any trip, any where in the world that he wants, but does any of those opportunities or things bring lasting contentment for you? And he admitted that those things are nice. And I would agree. He said he feels extremely blessed to have those things. And he gives God the credit for everything that he has. But ultimately, those things are not what brings the lasting day-to-day -day fulfillment, even for him. I happen to know this, this man keeps a Bible next to his recliner. And he spends time every morning seeking God and discovering the principles of the Word of God. And, and he, said, he said that that, that is what sustains him. That is is what keeps him feeling the contentment that's needed in life. It's not the stuff. It's not the next trip. Because once that trip is over, it's back to day-to-day -day business. 
Once that new new car smell is gone, guess what? It's gone and the thrill of that new car is gone. He said the same thing several times. He said, all of those things are going to burn one day. And I can't take any of those things with me when I go to heaven. And that's my goal. I want to get to heaven. In fact, I think it's very interesting. There's times when he longs for a more simplistic form of life, actually. Another thing that's interesting. The only difference between he and I is that he has more things, more expensive things. And he gets to go on more trips. But the thing that brings contentment to both of our lives is available to either one of us, no matter how much money either one of us has. Yes, it would be nice to have more money. But I'm not living for stuff. I'm living for Jesus. And I'm living for relationship with Jesus. And I'm living for service in the kingdom of God. And I'm living for relationship with the people that matter the most in my life. John Stott wrote, Contentment is the secret of inward peace. It remembers the stark truth that we brought nothing into this world and we can't take anything out of it. Life, in fact, is a journey from one moment of nakedness to another. The number one most important part of that rich man's life was his time every day with Jesus. It doesn't matter what you have as long as you have Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things, everything, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Contentment knows that if we have Jesus, we have enough. In fact, when we truly have Jesus, we have everything that we need. How can I get that through your head tonight? If we have Jesus, we have everything... That we need. Contentment comes when we can honestly say with the Apostle Paul, I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether I'm well fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I'm able to do all things, everything through Christ who gives me the strength. And you have to understand that contentment is learned. It's not natural. We're not born with contentment. It's it's not a gift. It's something that is learned. And our tendency is to, to look for things that will make us content. Those things that are better or those events in our life that are that are next, instead of making the effort to learn. How to be content. Contentment takes a willingness and and an effort to learn. And we can't just wish things into existence. Contentment has to be learned. Let me ask you a question tonight. What's the one thing that's separating you from joy? How would would you fill in this blank? I'll be happy when I... What? Fill in that blank for yourself. I'll be happy when I, when I'm healed. I'll be happy when I'm I'm promoted on my job. I'll be happy when I'm married. I'll be happy when I'm single. I'll be happy when I win the lottery. How would you finish that statement? Now I want you to answer this. If you never achieve that one thing that will make you happy. 
If your dream never actually comes true, if the, if the situation never changes for you, is happiness out of your reach? And if so, then you're living within the grip of discontentment. You see, contentment isn't denying your feelings about wanting or desiring what you can't have. But instead, it's actually showing a freedom from being controlled by those feelings. It's very obvious that Paul had a freedom that you can feel from his words to the Philippian church. Contentment isn't pretending that things are right when they're really not. But instead it shows the peace that comes from knowing that God is bigger than any of our problems and that He works them out for our good. Contentment isn't a feeling of well-being that's contingent on keeping circumstances under our control. But instead, contentment gives us a joy in spite of those circumstances. Looking to a God who never changes. Looking to a God who supplies everything that we need. Contentment isn't based on external circumstances. But instead, it's based on on an internal source within me. Contentment is of the heart. And it can only be given by God. Listen to this, the majority of people in our society suffer from counterfeit happiness. They're like a thermometer that gives a false high that quickly leaves as soon as the external circumstances begin to change. They hope that the next superficial satisfaction is going to last, but but external happiness is sort of like candy. It's sweet for a moment, but it dissolves way too quickly. A person who is happy because of a, of a dream vacation is a person who really only has a few days to be happy. But a person who has learned to cultivate that deep inner contentment will be full of joy wherever they may go and whatever state they may find themselves in. Most people thirst for what the Apostle Paul had. That long-lasting contentment. A deep, soul-satisfying contentment. And that kind of contentment only comes from Jesus Christ. Contentment has everything. Contentment has everything to do with what's going on inside of you. Not what the external circumstances are like. Whether they be good or whether they be bad. True contentment really only has one source. And that source is found in a soul-satisfying relationship with Jesus Christ. Who cares for us. Who deeply cares for us and promises to meet us and support us. No matter where we may find our life in. Contentment is a matter of accepting from God's hand just what He desires to give us. Because we know that He is a good God and He desires to give good gifts to His children. And so we accept from God's hand whatever He gives. Everything that we need, He will supply. Every pain and every suffering that seems like it can't be corrected, God is able to redeem us. And He'll bring healing in His perfect time and in His perfect way. And if we fail to surrender to the Lord's will, unfortunately, we'll have to live with that annoying feeling of discontent. And it's amazing how our freedom will be suffocated. And we'll be in bondage to our own desires. And our relationships will be poisoned with jealousy and competition. And our potential blessings will be sacrificed because discontentment has a way of destroying our peace and robbing us of our joy and making us miserable inside. Those things that we expect to bring contentment, they surprisingly don't. We can't depend on contentment to to fall into our laps from, from education or money 
or status because contentment comes only from a divine source that money and material possessions and accomplishments can't provide. So what's the secret that Paul is trying to tell the Philippian church? Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yes. Yes. And so the foundation of contentment is death. Death on the cross, remembering that what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Because of the cross... We're freed from the chains of sin. Because of the cross, we find salvation. Because of the cross, our relationship with Christ is possible. Because of the cross, our future in heaven is possible. And it's remembering all things that He has done for us through His death. What else, Paul? What else are you teaching us? Paul says in chapter 3, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Contentment is just not possible if we're holding on to our past failures and mistakes. And I really felt specifically to say that line tonight. Whether it be ours or someone else's. If we're holding on to resentment, contentment is not possible. There's a difference between ignoring past wrongs and forgetting them. Because forgetting them means that we work through the process of forgiving others and allowing God's forgiveness to cover us. And we grieve those losses in our life. That's biblical. And we somehow let go of statements that begin with, well, I should have, or, or if only, or if they just wouldn't have done this to me, or, or they just wouldn't have done that. True forgiveness requires that we see those wrongs very clearly. We don't ignore them. We communicate them. And we release them to God. And then we walk away from them. And this process may take some time and it may take some help and, it, and it's got to be done properly to avoid any future damage. But without it, we'll never have a content heart. So what else, Paul? What else are you teaching us? Chapter 4, verse 19, But my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's here that, that we wait on God and, and we surrender our desires and our, and our timetable and our future to Him. And we surrender our service to Him. Discontentment comes when our focus is not right. And, and if we focus on stuff. And we, and we focus on what others have. And what others are doing. And, and positions and status. And things that don't really matter in this life. There's no doubt. That in these circumstances. There will be discontent. But if we focus on Christ. And we live each day in the light of His glory. Then the things of this earth come. Become medial and. And He supplies everything, everything that we need. What else, Paul? What else is going to help me find contentment? Chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul shows his sufficiency is not in himself, but his sufficiency is in Christ. That he can do all things. He can do everything. Paul can do everything, but it's only through Christ who gives him the strength that he needs. In the context of the scripture, it means being at peace with Christ's sufficiency. And when his powerful presence is consuming us, we can do all things. Christ hasn't given us unlimited strength. That's not what he's saying. But we can experience contentment because we continually receive his supernatural strength in our lives. 
You see, our human determination may help us to endure some adversity and and some pain, and that definitely makes a difference. Our emotional healthiness will no doubt help us get through job loss and financial hardships and COVID and hurricanes and whatever else may come our way. There's no doubt about that. But it's only through Christ that we can generate that deep contentment within us with all of the circumstances that are going on around us. I can't bring it to you. I can't give contentment to you. All I can do is point you to Him. All I can do is point you to Jesus because Jesus is our source. Jesus Christ is everything. Jesus Christ gives us everything that we need because Jesus is the source. You see, Paul found freedom through his contentment. Paul said, I have found where my needs are met and I will not be moved. I have found where my needs are met And I will not be moved. And I'm closing. Neil, why don't you run up here, buddy? This is my son, my 10-year-old son, Neil. Isn't he a good-looking boy? I love this boy. Sometimes he does some things that he shouldn't do. Oh, yeah, Brother Cox. (laughs) Sunday, I I received a text from him during the middle of worship. He was sitting with my in-laws across the church, and and I received a text from him in the middle of worship. And my first thought was, boy, you better put that phone down. And then I looked at the text, and uh, it was a picture of a drawing that he had made. Put that picture up there. He said, POA rules easily. And I I couldn't get mad at that. I I thought, man, that's good. I love that. And then I got to look at it a little closer. The next page, next zooming in. This is on the right side of that picture. It says, POA is my home. I love that. I'm glad that he loves his, his church. And then it said, God is my peacemaker. You know, this, this boy loves to play. He loves to play ball. He loves to hunt. He does a pretty good job in school. He's a normal boy. But there's nothing better in my life than to know that my, my son knows who his peacemaker is. Thank you. There's nothing more important than me than to know that my kids know where they're going to get true contentment and true peace and true, true joy and true happiness. And it's only that contentment only comes through Jesus Christ. nothing more important than me than that right there can you all stand I told myself I wasn't going to cry tonight (laughs) something about that boy over there you give me everything I need when I can't see it you lead me when I can't hear it you show me when I can't stand you carry me when I'm lost you find me when I'm weak you are mighty you are everything I need you give me everything you give me everything you give me everything I need I've personally had to learn contentment in my life the hard way 
And most of us in this room are still learning. But the greatest state that we can, that we can be in is to be free. And the only way we can be free is when we know that He knows exactly what we need. And He's got it. And he, we can't run to anything else and feel that same contentment. He is our everything. My God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. By Christ Jesus. Psalms 1611. Thou will show me the path of life in the presence, in thy presence. In thy presence. This fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But you have to be willing to let him know that. You have to be willing to let him know that you, that you need him. And that you want him. And it's getting late here, but I would like for us to just lift our hands if you don't mind. If you want to, I know we're social distancing. If you want to walk to the front, you need prayer, that's love for you to walk to the front if you want somebody to pray for you we'll pray for you if you want to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost we'll be here and pray with you if you want to be baptized in Jesus name we can do that tonight but I wish you would just lift your hands for just a moment I'm not going to hold you long but just lift your hands for a moment let the presence of the Lord sweep over you right now. Feel His joy. Feel His happiness. Feel that contentment of His Spirit sweep into you right now. That refreshing. That refreshing. That refreshing Spirit moving through you and in you. us by online we pray a special blessing over you right now we pray that that contentment and that joy and that happiness would sweep into your home thank you for being with us God bless you thank you so much for joining us online we pray that you were touched by today's worship and message we hope that you'll join us again next service if you would like to know more about our church, you can download our POA app or visit our website at poa.church. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks again for watching. Have a great and blessed week.